friends, welcome back to the part 2 of the lecture number 39. So, we have been talking about data mining, right? Discussing about data mining, multiple dimensional view of data mining. And there I talked about what is to be mined and why to be mined and what are the things we can get out of it, right? So, let us not talk about data warehouses because data warehouses is something where we keep the data. And uh, data warehouses can be subject oriented like it can be oriented around major subjects based on you know material science you can have physical properties you know we can have structure characterizations just like in a normal life you have customers products sales right for business you can also focus on modeling analysis of data on for decision makers not daily operations it can provide you simple and concise view around particular subjects by excluding data that are not useful in decision making process. And you can also do integrated warehouses. You can create uh, data warehouses by integrating multiple heterogeneous data sources like relational databases, online transactional records. But this also needs to have facilities like data cleaning, data integration techniques, right, which can ensure you consistency in terms of uh, you know, providing conventions, encoding structures attribute measures. Also, when you move data uh, to their warehouses, it can be convertible also. So, that is what is the integration integrated databases does. It has to be also time variant because time horizon for data warehouses is very significantly longer than the operational systems. So, most of the warehouses must keep current value data and so it can also provide information from historical perspectives like past 5 to 10 years, but the key structure in data warehouses is that it contains it must contain an element of time which is explicitly or implicitly defined and the C aspect it should be explicitly or implicitly defined. So, that the customer who are going to take data from our houses must know it. You can also built in the what is called non volatility. A physically separate store for data transformed from an operational environment should be there. You cannot store the same thing in operational environment and in operational update of data does not occur in the data warehouse environment most of the cases. Uh, so, therefore, it does not require really transaction processing recovery you know control mechanisms. So, only requires two operationals in data process access initial loading of data and access of the data that is all you require. Also, we need to know how it can reference it between two important things. One is called online transaction processing, other is called online analytical processing. So, normally users for online transaction processing or well TP is clerk or IT professional, but analytical processing mostly done by knowledge workers like you and me scientist. Functions for the OLT, OLTP is basically day to day. Uh, but all app is basically much much better decent support. Data should be current up to date for the OLTP, but for all app it can be historical also it can be summarized in a multi dimensional way consolidated. So, normally uses for OLTP is very repetitive many people will use many times, but all app is always ad hoc it does not depends on how many people are using at a time it will be always ad hoc accessibility will be read or write or index or hash on prime, but it will be accessible by lots of scan. How do you do unit of work? Unit of work is basically short in case of OLTP simple transactions, but OLTP will have a very complex queries and you know that is why well OLTP has thousands of users record access will be tens at a time, but OLTP will have hundreds only hundreds of users it will have millions of you know record access possible. And that is why it will require terabytes of data, but on other than OLTP requires only megabytes hundreds of megabytes to gigabyte data. So, matrix is basically transaction throughput and here matrix should be Q query throughput or response. These two are the major ways by which the data can be accessed in warehouses. So, data warehouse is basically a multi tiered architecture systems uh, where you can have like you know operational databases you can keep it here or you can have other sources also and that will create you metadata as I already talked about it right. And this metadata will be monitored or regulated 
and this will provide you the data marts or markets right. So, OLAP server will take the data and analyze the data and provide you font to end tools right that is what it is. So, in a nutshell this is what is going to come in future right this whole thing it will be a little open a new business. So, different kind of data sources will be placed in data warehouses and they will provide you metadata and which can be monitored integrated and then it can be used as a source in the market and then obviously, they can also provide you OLAP servers which can do analysis of the data and prepare reports and also do data mining you know that is what is going to be happening. So, let us talk about you know what are the things this analysis things we can do the databases can do. So, let me uh, put it together there a uh, little bit on the board what are the analysis it can do as we tell the basic objective is pattern recognition right pattern recognition that provides you knowledge and knowledge provides you discovery right a design rather. And uh, second thing is basically predictive capability, these are the two objectives of material informatics. How do you do it? So, as you have seen I have already discussed data or I say data. So, we have to analyze the data. So, that is what is called data analytics. In material science data analytics is coming very new let us jot it down what are the things it should do. First thing you should do is cluster analysis. You know I have already given you some hints about what is cluster analysis that is like a Michael Asby's way of analyzing data. It can provide you informations like uh, you know it can provide you finding groups of closely related closely related observations or you know it can provide you valuable information in targeting groups of data that may have well behaved correlations or it can give you uh, you know uh, form the basis for physics based or statistically based models that is these are the things it can do right. So, let me put it down uh, it can find allow you to find groups find closely related groups. right it can allow us to find, find also uh, well behaved correlations among the data what all provide in my class this book it can do all those kinds of thing it can also provide you physics based as well as statistically based based models ok. From the data we can get models physics based or statistical statistical based models and then models can be used for prediction that is the first that the cluster analysis can do it can find closely related groups it can uh, find also well behaved correlations it can also find out odd behaved correlation also by the way, but well behaved correlation is very easy and then you can from that you can find physics based or sorry, statistical based models actually. Second thing what data analysis can give you is the predictive modeling. In fact, atmospheric modeling is done by that way only. How do you predict weather basically taking the information from the uh, what is available now I can make a model predictive model to predict whether for the next 48 hours right that is what is done. This is what is used here to build model for target objectives they can help us to build model for target objectives like target set of properties or target set of processing 
conditions which can give us properties target objectives. So, build models for target set of objectives. Remember everything is kind of handily providing you models statistical based model, physics based model or chemistry based models. So, uh, you know what kind of it it is uh, it can provide you uh, uh, you know model for different functions like you know with uh, inputs or exploratory variables, but success of these models can also help us refine the models and the usefulness and relevance of these uh, data. So, whether they will be successful or not that will depends on all these many other parameters let us not talk about it, but basically it allows to build models for target objectives, target objective means target set of properties, set of properties or processing condition right we do processing conditions. This is third thing it can do. The second thing, sorry. Third thing, what it can do is associate association analysis. What is that? Basically, it is used to discover patterns that describe strongly associated features in data. Again, discovery of patterns. Patterns which which will this describe which describes strongly correlated or strongly associated features in data that is the pattern we always look for the patterns which will provide you strongly correlated or strongly associated features in the data that is the pattern always you want to understand and know. Fourth thing what it can do? It can do anomaly detection outliers. Outliers because in modeling you have to remove these outliers to do a effective models that is what is required. And fifth thing what it can do? It can also do feature selection. Okay. What are this? This is basically called uh, identify variables or parameters. identification of variables or parameters from data. So, this five things data analytics is supposed to do cluster analysis, predictive modeling, associative analysis anomaly detection and feature selection. These are the important aspects these uh, to be done by these by the this models actually or by the uh, data analytics. So, as you understand that data sets are made up of data right always. So, let me find out ok I got it. So, data sets actually provide you set of data and it can be like customer data or material data you know or patient data or student data right. And then objectives will, will be described by attributes we know attributes are features. So, normally in databases you provide you in the rows you provide data objects columns will provide you data attributes as you have seen that. So, attributes can be dimension features variables like customer ID name address we always talk about it in your ID card you have a name address your number everything will be written. It can be also types like nominal or binary it can be interval scale ratio scale there are many many types of attributes possible, but once you have the attributes of the data what is the first thing you do? First thing you have to do is to measure the central tendency of the data that is a statistical tool right. 
and what is that? It provides you information about central tendency like statistics like mean. Okay. So, as you see mean I have given x bar is 1 by n summation of the all the data. It can also be mean can be also like that summation of all the data divided by capital N. You can also have average weighted mean like w i x i divided by w i summit over right all kinds of things are possible. This is a statistical tool. So, I do not need to explain much details for you to understand. Then you can also have median is the middle value if odd number of variables uh, values or average number of middle uh, values to sorry it is basically mid, middle value if the odd number of variables exist okay. and this is always inter ex, estimated by interpolations. So, median is like L 1 plus n by 2 minus frequency i this okay. this is what is so this is median and the mode is the value which occur most frequently in the data. So, median is basically middle value if odd number of values are exist right that is what is median is and mode is a value which occurs most frequently in the data. It can be unimodal, it can be bimodal, it can be tie model. So, we know that mean minus mode is 3 into mean minus median like this is what I show you the age and frequency of the students or uh, frequency of the people in a, in a city or in a apartment complex you see small number of uh, small ages 0 1 to 5 is only 200, 6 to 15 is 450, 21 to 50 is largest 1500 is a middle level group. And 81 to 110 is 44 only very small right. So, if you want to find out uh, the distribution of this kind of data using mean, mode, uh, median you can use this formula to do that that is what is the idea is. So, then you can, can plot this data and uh, depending on the nature of the plot it can be symmetric plot you can see here a symmetric plot that is so called a Gaussian uh, you have mean mode median is sitting on the peak of this curve correct, but it can be also like that this curve is positively skewed where mode is on the peak and median and mean is on the other side of the curve correct right side of the mode, but if it negatively skewed it will be other way mode is on the peak and median mean and median is on the left side that is called negatively skewed. Many times this information is required to know the how the strain of the data which you are analyzing. You can also do analysis using box plots. What is that? Box plots provide you five important informations plotted in one Medi minimum, maximum, q1, q3, q1, q2, q3. So, minimum, maximum, median, q1, and q3. Okay. Let me explain what is called minimum is the lowest value in the data sets, what is maximum is the highest value in the data sets, no need of explaining. q1 is the first quartile is the middle value of the lower half of the data. So, normally what happened quartile means 50 to 25 percent right you divide your data into 4 quartiles 25, 25, 25, 25 percentage. So, if you take first 25 percent data then take the middle value of that it is called first quartile. Median is already discussed middle value of the entire data sets. Third quartile is middle value of the upper half of the data third quartile you understand right first quartile is lowest 25 percent data, second quarter after 20 that 25 percent then third quartile comes and maximum is the maximum data. So, box plot provides this five numbers summary of the data very important it is used in uh, different kinds of material informatics in material science also. So, data is represented by with a box you can see here this is a box I think this is maximum this is minimum this is the median this is the q1 q, uh, this is the q3 that is what is the whole thing. So, we are imagine that how well representative is this. So, you hear it is called lower extreme, upper extreme, minima, maximum, median, then your lower quartile, upper quartile. This provides you a lot of information about the data that is called as a box plot. Now, visualization of these things can be possible by 2D or 3D, like here reporting profit, revenue, cost, right. And you can see here these are the box median, median is here, upper quartile, lower quartile, q1, q2, right, and minimum and maximum. That is way it can be visualized and understood this kind of data. You can also do a normal distribution that is called Gaussian distribution, where you can actually plot from mean to this is the mean and standard deviation, 
or standard deviation mean to plus standard deviation that is what is happened. So, in Gaussian distribution this is what is your mean is correct then this is mean plus uh, mean minus and mean plus standard deviation this is mean plus 2 standard deviation mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma correct and this is your complete okay. this is what is your mu minus 3 sigma and mu plus 3 sigma correct. So, each of these things provides you nature of distribution of data how the data is right. One can also do histogram analysis like you can do graph display of tabulated frequencies it provide in terms of bars histogram all of you have done right and it shows you what proportion of the cases fall in each several categories. It can differ from bar charts okay. bar charts are provides you uh, area and what here is provides you histogram provides you frequencies. Categories are usually specified as non overlapping intervals of some variables. So, this let us not you can one can also do a scatter plot this provides you first look of the bivariate data to see the cluster points or outliers you can see this is outlier this is outlier right. Each pair of values is treated as a pair of coordinates like here unit price versus item sold. So, you can see one cluster here one cluster there there are many other clusters present. These scatter plots are very widely used in material science these are plots will look like this and this provides you how the data are scattered which which part of the uh, you know region region of this plot data are mostly uh, present that is what is uh, scatter plots can provide and is widely used in material science. Then one can also do negatively positively correlated data uh, you know left half fragment is positively correlated you can see here right half is a negatively correlated data. But anyway when you, we already talked about it this one uh, when you talked about it something else right here uh, that we talked about skewed skewed. Uh, means how the data is spread that is what is skewed is called uh, you can have this kind of plot or that kind of plots where negative positively skewed possible, but correlation is different Wha what is that we are talking about it here correlation means whether negatively related or core positively related however they are connected strongly or they are connected very weakly that is what is meaning of positively and negatively correlated data. You can also have uncorrelated data many times you need that and then material in also informatics also you can see in this plots you have lot of uncorrelated data you do not see specific clusters no correlation found. So, there are many ways you one can visualize other than these two these things you can visualize of geometric transformations or projection of data you can use scatter plots you can use landscapes ok I am not talking about you can landscape you can use post section views hyper slice par parallel coordinates all kinds of ways you one can visualize data you have to find the pattern type of pattern the data is are showing that is what is the main need of the material informatics and to in order to get that pattern we plot it in different ways that is that is something one can obtain from any statistical uh, you know ways means. One can also do dimensional stacking you know that is called partition of n dimensional attribute space in 2D subspace this you have done in case of image processing I remember uh, we have done that actually. So, what you do is basically partition of the attribute values ranges into classes and like here you have two attributes and we can take a small portion of the attributes and you can create different classes of attributes like that that is what is some many cases required because you may have a huge data let us talk about you know image processing data then you have a lot of data you may not be able to handle it properly then what do you do you try to understand uh, the kind of you know stacking how what is making this whole data, data that is what is it. So, you know another important analysis which we can do is basically call a principal uh, component analysis. This is a machine learning technique that reduces the number of variables in a data sets while preserving the most of the important information. Basically it is a dimensional reduction technique very widely used I am just introducing that we will continue in the next lecture and you know it is a kind of a technique which reduces the number of variables in a data sets while preserving the most important informations ok. So, PCA is something which is uh, more widely used in case of material science. So, I will just introduce it today 
at the next lecture, which is the last lecture, we will talk about more details of that. It is called Pearson correlation analysis. It is discovered in 1901, long back mathematically. And you know, C stands for correlation, it finds correlation of data. Okay. So, major objective is to uh, you know reduce dimensionality of the data. What do you mean by that? It means number of variables. in data sets, uh, but when you do that, you have to preserve with preservation, preservation of most important information, you cannot distort that. That is the objective. Of Pearson correlation analysis. So, how does it works? It works in very simple way. It creates new variables. PCA creates new variables, the which are called principal component. Okay. So, this is not correlation, this is component. Okay. which are called principal components that can be this this variables can be linear combination combination of original variables the sort it works and basically it has to transform the variables which are there to a new set of variables and that can be obtained by linear combination of the whatever variables available. And you know this is very important, it provides you, makes you analyze the data very uh, nicely, so that it can reduce the number of variables. Many times you need in material informatics to reduce the number of variables widely and it is exploratory in nature and it founds application in all fields of machine learning, data learning or whatever. So, we will talk about this uh, PCA uh, next class in more detail, I will explain you for a simple mathematical example, how it can be useful next class. But the next class is going to be your last lecture. So, first of all the next class we will talk about this PCA and you know how the data, uh, the informatical informatics can be used. Uh, what are the ways to use that right? uh, applications of that, we will give you some examples. And the last part of the lecture, we will sum it up whole course, whatever we learned so far, so that it can help you understand that. That is the part of the last lecture. So, first we will learn the PCA in a little bit detailed manner, then we will talk about what the application of the material informatics with some examples and finally, we will sum it up what do we learn and how to go forward. Thank you.